Hold on, everybody. Probably turn this. Everybody, pose for a second. I'm gonna take a screenshot and post it on social media. <laughs> Great pose, guys. <laughs> Are these people with like no jobs and shit that watch this stuff? <laughs> Howard, you can't say that. They're kids. <laughs> Come <I'm sorry>. on. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Man, you say something. Look how many people just get offended. <laughs> uh, Everyone's right. like, well, I, I have a job. Ooh. I make money. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Uh. All right, we got some people in here. I've posted on Twitter. My bot automatically notified my Discord server, so we should. Neil, be, are we uh, gonna do the are we gonna do the hair thing, Neil? Yeah, but I haven't washed mine since the uh, since the show last night. So it's, <laughs> it's a, I've, got, I've got rock concert rock concert we, hair. We get into we get into the call, and these guys <laughs> insist on showing everybody their hair to prove that they have hair. <laughs> It's a hat thing. I, well, because we wear, we wear hats so much, it's like, wait a minute. That's right. <laughs> yeah. People go, oh, what's under that hat? You know? Yep. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, people of the internet, I'm Jonathan Young. Welcome to the stream. Uh, I'm here with Howard Benson, uh, who probably produced your favorite song uh, when you were growing up. Uh, and Neil Sanderson, who may have written and played drums on your favorite song growing up. Uh, Neil, of course, from Three Days Grace. Uh, and we're, we're talking about talking about music, talking about the my new album that we've been working on. And uh, we have a song that is done. Uh, and I'm shooting the music, or finishing the music video this week. We've shot half of it. Uh, some of you heard me working on it. And you can type wolf, exclamation point wolf in the chat to pre-save Wolf Within right now. It's official. There's also a button down below the stream that says pre-save Wolf Within. You can hit that. And uh, let's pump those numbers up. Very it's exciting. It's a really heavy song. It's a very, very heavy song. Yeah. Yeah, we're stoked I, I, to work with John. Yeah. Awesome. I, I can I can credit myself as a, a, a co-writer on this because I changed one <laughs> word. I think. Yeah, you ch <laughs> you changed the the because originally Whoa. it was Beast Within, yeah. and I I called Neil. I was like, I'm writing this song called Beast Within. He was like, change it to Wolf Within. I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what they say? Ch change a word, get a third. Fifty percent royalties. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. no, it's, it's awesome, man. This is this record, like from front to back, is just gonna be like it. I like how you, I don't know. There's, there's like moments of like, just it's almost like galloping metal. Uh, it's like vi Viking style, but then it has like some ghost kind of vibe sometimes. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's it's really well thought out. So I can't wait to to draw to see people react when we drop yeah. it. Yeah, Jonathan, it was a year ago when I was on vacation. I remember we were talking, me and Grady, and I think Neil were on that call talking to you, and uh, we kept getting cut off because I was in the Adirondacks, and you brought up the idea of doing this album. Yes. Yeah. This, uh, this kind of album. And I remember where we were driving because I kept losing you the phone call. Yeah. And I kept getting like, we want to make an, an album about wool, and then, a, you know, like, <laughs> uh, Vikings, and I was just getting these little words coming yeah. in and out. And I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Let's make it out like that. Yeah. You know? so. Man, Howard and Neil, you know, take turns here. But what what is your one sentence number one tip that you would tell anybody who wants to be a musician or, or an artist? Well, I got the answer for that. Don't do it. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, I, I'd have to say... Surround yourself, <laughs> surround yourself with not only like-minded individuals, but humble people who are in it for the right reasons. That's yeah. number one. That's number yeah. one. I've noticed over the years, I mean, Three Days Grace has been doing this professionally for 20 years now. The bands who uh, are like egotistical and in it for the wrong reasons and think that they, you know, bleed royal blood, um, don't they don't last and the bands that are humble and just like keep their head down and do the work they're the ones that stick around you know yeah so. what's the what's the hardest chorus that you've ever written trinity send asks 
Mm. I'm curious what you what your answer to that is, Neil. Some of it are well, is, are the most simple courses because the, uh, with like very little. I mean, our song "The Mountain," the chorus is you know is pretty like it's not like super complex, but we had like 40 versions of it. I, I, you remember that, Howard? Where I think Matt had to fly down to LA to like sing one line with Howard because we just we just had to get it right. And, and um, the hardest part about songwriting is keeping it honest you know nightmare mode sorry go ahead Neil yeah it's just keeping it honest and real and genuine and not contrived is super hard and for the mountain we didn't want to make it like like it it was just about putting one foot in front of the other and like and and realizing even if you wake up at the bottom the next day you still got you don't you don't have a choice you can't just stay at the bottom you got to try to put one foot in front of the other every day and that's like a that's a real you know that's yeah. a real condition that that humans have to face, and it was hard to kind of get that right. You know, uh, it's you know, I look at it like you just want to. It's it becomes there's like five percent of it's inspiration and ninety five percent is perspiration, and that's really true when it comes to making records because you know you get inspired with the Neil's really good at coming up with song titles and everything like that, but then after the song title, there's the whole part of creating the track which is, uh, you know, making a ton of decisions because so, we, we basically have 180 seconds to work with. That's our, our, our palette. So it's th- let's just pretend it's like three minutes and we have to do a whole story and feeling because we're selling feelings. We're not selling perfection here. So we have to get a feeling across in 180 seconds. And I just noticed that somebody said, how many instruments is too much to put on an album? You know, if you can get away with a guitar and a vocal, then that's fine as long as the feeling gets across but if you know we see a lot of sessions coming in from uh people who have just started recording where they use every ounce of cpu power in their computer to put as many tracks on as they can yeah and that's usually our job i mean i can tell you when we do a three days grace record it's usually what are we not going to use that's the decisions like what do we take out what do we not need like how many uh, background vocals do we really need here? How many guitar parts do we really need here? Because there's one, if you're in a four piece band, there's actually five people in your band, but you may not realize it. And the fifth person is a thing called space. And it means don't play. It's like, if you look at a score, it's that little curly cue thing that means rest. Then there's tons of them in, in music. There's like a lot of rests. So if you play on every single 16th note, you're doing something wrong. You shouldn't have to do that. You should have a lot of space in your music because, again, I've used this analogy before, but it's kind of like when you buy a house and you walk into this brand new house and you go, man, look at this big ass house I got. And then you start putting furniture in it and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And you walk through the front door and goes, man, look at this small little house I have. Well, that's kind of <laughs> how music is. So if you keep loading your music up with furniture, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You may think it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but the fact is, it gets smaller and smaller. So there's no room for reverb. There's no room for like like a thought to go, wow, he just said something profound that hit me before the next <laughs> instrument comes in and distracts you from that thought. So it's tough being, um, I think in any of the arts, be it production or video or making movies, like they say it ended up on the cutting room floor. That's not just some phrase that somebody made up. The truth is most stuff does end up on the cutting room floor that we do. Like, if you look at a Three Days Grace record, we may record 150 tracks, but we may be mixing maybe 45 of them. Maybe. I'll, yeah, I'll my, there, but, my, but, my but, college yeah. composition yeah. teacher once, something that he said that really stuck with me, right, right, right after he uh, advised me to drop out of college, <laughs> he was like, you shouldn't be here, you're wasting your money at music school. Uh, he said something, he was like, you can tell how good a song is by if it's still a good song if you just play it with a, an acoustic guitar and sing. Yeah, we and call I, that. Uh, it's it's funny. We we actually, I completely agree. Um, and we do that right at the end of of uh, you know the process before we go into the studio. We do some, we call it the campfire test. And yeah. I have folders. I have folders labeled CFT for every record that three days grace has ever made the campfire test and, and it's like because you know with modern recording even though even if we're making a demo 
you can make it sound huge, you know, and you play it, it's like, yeah, the drum, the, the program drums sound huge, the program bass sounds massive, you know, the vocals are all great and everything. But um, you, you can kind of fool yourself with all that production. Um, and so we always take one guitar, one vocal, and, and put it down and just like, and no, no bells and whistles, and then sleep on it. And then if that holds it up, if that makes you feel something, then you know it's a good song. So I think that, you know, to, to, to finish sort of that question on like advice on that, do the campfire test before you go spend all your money at the studio and and play and play the campfire test version for people and say like does this move you does it are you compelled and engaged by what is happening here emotionally and the, and i think that that's always important the other thing that i like about the campfire test is that it makes you ask what about this performance is is uh making you feel something cuz i feel like a lot especially like kids in my age bracket i've noticed really like to lean on like the production to make you feel something and and that's become so commonplace that a lot of writers and producers are like banking on the drum beat making you feel a certain way or the you know the the however you're producing the synth pads making you feel a certain way but then a lot of those people are singing at the same time and or they're you know writing a melody or a chord progression at the same time but because they're so hyper fixated on how this 808 kick sounds or something like that they're not paying any attention to like learning how to sing the song in the way that it needs to be sung and then that's the issue right yeah and Jonathan you're right about this the issue with a lot of um people that having DAWs and you can get a doll now for almost nothing you know oh you yeah reaper a, is free you know, with garage bands and yeah. all this stuff so the problem is that a lot of really i think potentially great songwriters have mistakenly become mistakenly good music engineers and they stop writing songs and they spend like you said you only have x amount of hours per day and they spend a lot of time searching for that perfect sample when really what they should be doing in my opinion is sitting on the edge of the bed and writing about how bad they feel about the girlfriend or boyfriend that just left them. Yeah. Because that's what people really give a shit about. It's like that's the feeling you're selling, not the 808. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, and and to that point, you can always pay somebody to make your 808 sound good. You know, like, you, but you can't, like, really pay somebody to, to share your own personal uh, story. And you, you, like, hey, John, someone just called you out here. Were you searching for the perfect snare? Well, yeah, I was. <laughs> But I'm, uh, <laughs> but, that's a, hey, but that's a drummer thing. But that's I also, I, in John's yeah, defense, that, that's, that's a drummer by thing. The way, by the way, John, I don't know. I mean, everybody probably knows I'm here, but John, John is like a crushing drummer too. Like, oh. you, you've got the, the pipe. There's, there was a question that someone asked earlier. Hold on, hold on. Before, before we answer any more questions, before I lose my train of thought, I wanted to say, Howard, how much I love that tip that you gave about leaving space. And, uh, yeah. and I think about that a lot and I like to think of it like you know that moment on, on a roller coaster where you go down a roller coaster hill and then you go up and then there's that moment yeah. where you're like floating that's right. like how I've always yeah. pictured that when like when you suck space out in like a rock song and Three Days Grace has always been really good at that and uh, I think that's great that that's in the front of your mind for tips. Anyway, well, EDM music has done a great job with drops. EDM when they put drops in, that's an amazing use of space e right there. EDM you know? and and metal music are very close together, and not very many people realize that. It's all about yeah. the the build and then the drop. Yeah, tension. You know, it's all about tension and release. All yeah. everything. Music is about tension and release. Movies are about tension and release. Build it up, build it up, and lyrics. Yeah, really Rhymes, yeah. rhymes are about tension and release. Yeah, yeah. sex. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to get into that. Well, <laughs> no, but, oh, okay. But Neil next, actually is, next question. No, Neil is, it is. Neil is Neil's right. not kidding here because yeah. we have three minutes to do that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Which is about as long as y'all want. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Eighty seconds. That's all you got. Ninety oh. seconds. Oh. Yeah. No. I saw I saw a cartoon that was posted on the wall in the kitchen of a studio, and uh, it showed this you know scenario one 
where this drummer is just like clearly just going off and the producer standing beside him and says, you're amazing. And then the next frame, the drummer's going boom, pa. And the producer says, you're hired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I used to use Josh Freeze for all my records uh, that didn't have bands in them. And I used to joke with Josh. I said, we pay you so much money to play kick, snare, kick, snare. <laughs> and, and it's serious. Like that was his pretty much beat that he played on most of the records. And he had the discipline to play that beat. Yeah. Play it the way he played it. And yeah. it's crazy that I, I, I've thought about that exact thing a lot, though, because I feel like it's kind of a circle, right? Like, it, as you get better as a drummer, that like, and, and some people, like, never make it past certain parts of the circle. Like, you, you, you know, you get good at drums and you want to play faster and faster and more complicated and crazier time signatures and crazier, you know, more ridiculous, like... Uh, whatever and then you get to this point where you finally realize the beauty in a simple drum beat and then you're you're just you're back to the first beat that you learned and then that's when you it's like you you reach nirvana as a drummer when you come full circle and you start doing quarter note beats again <laughs> but no i mean yeah, yeah that, the one thing about all this advice we're giving you guys is those are not things that you need to you can break the rules. You just need to know what's going to happen when you break them. But people break the rules all the time. I mean, that's kind of, you know, like I'm a big harmony person when it comes to following the traditional harmony ways of doing things. But if you look at Alice in Chains and Lane Staley and those guys, they were breaking the rules with parallel force and parallel fists. And that changed the sound of music back then. So a lot of people started using parallel force and stuff. But that was, you know, it's okay as long as you're understanding kind of what's happening there, you know, or you yeah. like it and it appeals to you. It gives a feeling across. I thought it made those records sound more evil, which is why I think they, it was a really good call to well, do that. And if you think about like the rules anyway, like I think that's even like the the first problem that people have is they see them as rules when right th they're not really rules. They're like an explanation. Words, yeah, sure. it's yeah. it's like yeah. music theory and like the the rules of harmony are just explaining why most people in our culture like to hear certain combinations of notes. But th then there's this problem where, like, uh, a lot of, like, music schools and a lot of, like, people in, like, you know, teaching positions will kind of, like, act like, like you said, I mean, like, they'll look down on, like, Alice in Change for using Parallel Force and be, like, snobby about it and be like, well, they're not using traditional, class like, romantic era classical voice leading, so that's a bad song. And then... The kid that likes Alice in Chains is like, fuck you, I'm never going to listen to the rules again. But that kid could probably stand to benefit a lot if they, you know, if they didn't have someone turn them off to learning about that yeah. stuff. So, uh, Howard, you, uh, yeah. you always, um, I wanted to, I know that you and I have talked about this a lot, but since we're on stream and I harp on people so much whenever they ask me for singing tips i wanted to get you on record on this stream uh saying what you always make me do whenever i'm producing singers uh enunciate enunciate that's right you heard it here guys howard benson one of the best rock producers in the world <laughs> enunciate yeah yes it <laughs> solves a lot of problems yeah it actually uh not only do you get to hear the lyrics that you spent all these times all this time writing but you actually attack the words harder and it's if you have a singer that is not giving you enough energy a lot of times what i'll just do is say hey can you over over enunciate these words and you'd be amazed at the takes that come out those are the takes you end up using for the record are the ones that the singer thinks oh man i'm sounding like a typewriter right now but when you hear it through the din of a rock production with guitars bass drums and you hear that attacking on the notes, that's usually the take I am yeah. using. Howard, uh, <laughs> uh, Mary Yilly said, it's, it's it's kind of uncanny, uh, said, Howard's setup looks like a NASA control room. Um, <laughs> is that a coincidence, or uh, do you, you have a little background in that uh, field? If, can, you tell, can you tell them about that a little bit? Yes, I actually was a rocket scientist. I actually, my degree is in aerospace engineering, and I went to Drexel University for it, and... Uh, I worked at Garrett 
power systems and worked for uh, worked on leading edge sled actuation systems and turbine wheels and uh, gimbal, orbital gimbal actuators on the space shuttle. And I did that for about four years because my it's what my degree was in, it. and I just decided to. Uh, I looked ten years into the future and thought, which is going to be more exciting, uh, the the band I was playing in, and maybe that happens, or I'm stuck in an office the rest of my life. And uh, I decided to go with the band route, and and the band route didn't work out because I think our band, I, I keep joking around with this, but my ex band members don't like it, but I think we were literally the worst band, the worst band, and that's <laughs> in Hollywood. And uh, we used to, we were playing the Viper Room for like 20 people, and they were all Beverly Hills people because our manager was from Beverly Hills. And we would look across the room, look across at the whiskey, and Molly Crew had thousands of people lying down the Sunset Boulevard, and we laughed at them because we were like, oh, look at these guys in makeup with their metal stuff. Look what we're doing, smart music, you know? Like, and, and you know, <laughs> what, what I realized, um, and thank God there was a job called producer that I didn't have the, uh, and I think a lot of it had to do with being an aerospace engineer and everything like that and having good parents. I didn't really have that much to say to the youth of America. And uh, I wasn't like messed up enough to be an artist, no offense to the artists on this uh, call here. But um, uh, I, I, I had a pretty good upbringing. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, I sort of, uh, the job as a producer was combining the aerospace background, which was all the technical stuff, with being a music, a guy in a band, you know, and when you're in a guy in a band, it sounds simple and stupid, but you learn to play other people's songs, a lot of other people's songs. You're playing cover songs your whole, pretty much your whole life. So you get the chord progressions and you get the patterns and all this stuff starts to kind of become your 10,000 hours of uh, studying for, and you, by the time I started producing, I kind of had a lot of time spent in the music world. And I kind of got lucky because when Pro Tools came along, I was one of an early adopter of the computer stuff. And uh, it all fell together for me, you know, um, just knowing, you know, what I knew about, you know, technology combined with all the music stuff. And it's kind of weird because up until I had my first hit, I didn't really have that many hits. So I went from having like no hits to having bazillions of hits. All It was almost like it happened overnight. And I didn't know how to, you have to hold on for dear life when that shit happens. Because, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're on this like slow boat and this speeding train comes along and you just, <laughs> you, you don't have a choice. You're just holding on to this thing. And it's crazy life after that. So it's been pretty, I've been very lucky and I love, I love the job. It's a great job. I've been doing it a long time and I still keep doing it. And uh, I'm in partners with Neil at Judge and Jury Records and uh, Jonathan's one of our artists and um, to have it still a great time making records, you know, and it's great working with younger guys too, like Neil and Jonathan who are, you know, bring new fresh approaches. I think that when I looked at Clive Davis and, and Jimmy Iovine and the real greats, Walter Yetnikoff, all the greats in our business, Irving Azoff, they surrounded themselves with people who were younger than them and newer than them and had new ideas. And that's how they always stayed relevant in our business. They were constantly, I mean, Clive just turned 90. And Clive is still making records and still having hits. And so it's because he knows how to handle his business and keep the younger. You know, Jonathan, for example, has taught us a lot, me and Neil, about um, YouTube, just the way you monetize things and just how he handles his business. And um, it's been a bit of a wake up call for us a little bit on some of this stuff. But it's great to be around people like Jonathan and, you know, what he knows about, you know, that stuff. Not to not to stroke you too much. John. No, I, I'm. That's it's dangerous with you. <laughs> dangerous. Um, so no, what about uh, what about uh, what about songwriting advice, Neil? You mentioned uh, you mentioned writing from the heart, being honest, and uh, feeling. I, I used to talk. And yeah, and I uh, um, I always believe. I mean, every song's different, so there are always exceptions to the rule. But I do believe in the top-down approach. Um, and so, if you picture picture a, a pyramid. Or a triangle, if you will. Starting at the top, the top contains the title, and that top little part of the pyramid involves the chorus and the main message and the main just uh, nucleus of the song. Um, so I don't have a lot of luck, nor do I really enjoy writing sessions where someone comes in with a little versey verse riff. And we start kind of just working on a little verse that might turn into something. And then we sit there for a couple hours, but we still don't have a chorus. 
nor a concept, nor a title. Um, and that just doesn't, I, that just doesn't float my boat. I, I just don't, I don't like writing like that. Yeah. I, it does happen a lot. I like, like, t- here's the title because if you know, let me tell you quick, I'll tell you a quick story about a, a, a big three days grease hit that we had. Sorry, Howard, this isn't, this is like the one record that you didn't do, but we were still completely inspired by it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's a song. So we were writing with a legend, legendary writer out in Nashville. His name's Craig Wiseman. He won Songwriter of the Millennia. Uh, he wrote, like, you know, Tim McGraw. He's written Dolly Parton songs. He wrote, you know, it's just it's just a ma- massive writer. Massive writer. And uh, so he knew that he had... C- c- here's the other thing. is Three Days Grace generally brings in one other writer. There's the band and then one other person. That just works for us. Um, just because we're more motivated, that person's there to get a job done to write a song or start a song. So this particular day was in Nashville with the legendary Craig Wiseman. And uh, so we go into the session and, and he's just kind of sitting there and he's like, you know, he's like, I was laying in bed with my wife last night and watching TV. And um, and he said, I, you know, I was kind of just I had I had three days grace on the mind. I knew that this session was going to happen. And we were watching uh, uh, we were watching um, what's the big crime movie? There's a or, or crime shows. CSI. Uh, CSI. Yes. CSI. And he said, I was watching CSI. And I was watching the intro, and I saw an, a quick flashed-up image of a chalk outline. And the second he said chalk outline, I was like, that is a title that absolutely jumps off the page. It's never been done before. It's so sick. If there, it, there's so much poetry that we can extract from that, so many angles that we can take it. You left me here like a chalk outline that's just going to be you know, washed away by the rain anyways. And I just, and you'll just and and then that's nothing. And you, you keep coming back to the scene of the crime, you know. But like, it nothing's there anymore because the chalk's you know been washed off the sidewalk, and that's it. And you leave me. And, and there was so much poet poet poetic possibilities in that imagery. And, yeah. As soon yeah. as he said chalk outline, I was like, oh my god! Today we are writing a song called Chalk Outline, you know. And it was one of our biggest. It was one of our biggest hits. And so that is like the best example of the top-down approach of songwriting. Um, you know, we, this, it, the second he uttered that, I knew that it was going to be like a cool, fresh song. And then we just started working from the way da- from the top down. Yeah, I have a, something like that too. Where I, I was doing a band called My Chemical Romance, we didn't have an idea of what the project was going to be like. And uh, the A&R guy, who I give a lot of credit to, was listening to My Chemical Romances demo tape and at the very end of the side two he hears gerard way go i'm not okay i'm not okay i'm not okay yeah, like just chanting this thing out and he calls me up and he goes howard um what do you think about these lyrics for a song and you know at some point you've done this enough times where you go that lyric and that guy that's the whole project right there if we screw this up it's on us so basically I went back to rehearsal and said to Gerard, this lyric you wrote, I'm not okay, just write a song around that. And they went to the Oakwood, which back in the day, that's where the bands used to write their material. The Oakwood should get credit, by the way, for uh, all the songs. You know, the nickna- you know what the nickname <laughs> is? is uh, the Cokewood. Anyways. Cokewood. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't believe anybody slept in that place. But um, anyway, my Ken came back and wrote a song called I'm Not Okay. That really jump-started their career. But like Neil said, that's the top-down approach. I mean, you know, I think that's sort of defined. It's like a screen. It's like making a movie. Why would you make a movie without a uh, idea of what the movie's about? You don't just start filming, you know. Uh, if you want heavy metal song titles, just look at Black Magic: The Gathering cards. Like here we go, Surgical okay. Extraction. That's that's <laughs> decent. Twisted Embrace. That's Ooh. a magic card. Yeah, see song titles. Uh, here, what else do we got? Yeah, if super heavy metal, Throne of Death, Grave Lighter. <laughs> that's like a monster truck. Hey, Neil, Throne of Death is a, is a uh, what do you call it? What's that band, that metal band? Uh, Steel Panther. That's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Steel Panther. I title. love those guys. I love that band. <laughs> now, would the makers of Magic sue you for that, or what would happen there? Well, they don't own those two words. Like... You know, I mean, these are just two words put together. Like, they're not trademarking every, 
I, I'm working for them right now. I, I can. They're not going to sue you for. I mean, they're not going to trademark Beast Within and not let you write a song about that. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, we got to write a song called Throne of Death. Every morning I sit on the throne of death, where I may take my last breath. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> it sounds oh, like yeah. you're on the toilet. It sounds like you're on exactly the toilet. Exactly what it is. It's yeah, still it's, oh, yeah. it's, 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 it's loosely about it's loosely about Elvis Presley. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm I, I'm gonna hold you guys to that. I'll one hundred percent write a a, 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 a a shit post song with Steel Panther that's actually about taking a shit called Throne of Death. <laughs> Jonathan, so, when you write this, when you write with these guys, seriously, pull out the cards. Yeah. Just show them how we're writing. I will. You know. Yeah, I would love to. You know? I love. Yeah, that's that's gonna be my new thing. I'll just walk up to a writing session with a pile of magic cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. Well, yeah, right, let's, I gotta go. I gotta yeah, get back wrap to it up here. But right before uh, yeah. before we go, everybody, the link to pre-save the first single on the new Jonathan Young album, Wolf Within, is down below you can also type exclamation point wolf in the chat and the bot will give you a link uh you can scroll up in the chat as well howard and neil uh co-produced this song with me it's absolutely insane the music video is going to be the craziest thing you've ever seen on my channel i'm so excited um so yeah howard and neil cool thank you so Good much hanging with you guys yeah we'll do this again sometime and thank Don't you so much that. everybody for tuning in Take care, guys. Yeah. All right, bye.